pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, I would like to thank you, thank everyone for coming this evening. Um, at least we're, we're blessed in Blowing Rock to have the sun out. Uh, we'll all have to say the council did not vote on that, but I'm sure they've been unanimous. The, um, moving forward, uh, I would like a motion to approve the agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Regular agenda has been adopted. Now. Minute approvals. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes from May 13th, 2019, special meeting open and closed? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the May 14th, 2019, regular council meeting minutes? <coughs> Excuse me? Yes. Do I have a second? Second. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. It so passes. All right. Moving forward. On our public comments, we would greatly request that you would retain down, let's keep it at three minutes. If you would like to speak, uh, please visit Ms. Tonda over here and fill out a little sheet, and then she'll submit that to me. Um, please keep in mind that the public hearing for the project that we're voting on this evening cannot be discussed, okay? It is done. Um, so there cannot be any discussion on that from the podium or from the seats. So please try your best to work with us. I know it's hard. Uh, moving forward, uh, Mr. Crumpler. Yes. Uh, you wanted to speak from the floor, sir. Yes. It's like step up to the podium. And state your address. Uh, 215 Morningside Drive. <clears throat> I wanted to um, ask the town council tonight. Um, I understand that they're no longer enforcing uh, the three-hour parking on Main Street. Is that correct? That's what I'm, I'm understanding, and it's something about an appellate court ruling of some sort that they're looking at this current time. Uh, if I may ask Mr. Freeman, did you, sorry to drag you into this, Mr. Freeman? Yeah, I'm not that guy saying Barron was here, but he's not. Uh, yeah, we saw the appellate court decision on that. We were curious to how it would apply back in North Carolina to the south side. His last speaking with Aaron was that he was still going to continue uh, enforcing the three hour until he got further legal I spoke to the officer that was uh, marking the cars, and he said basically that his chalk stick had been taken away from him. He could not mark tires anymore. And the word's gotten out on the street, um, and it's been uh, whatever abuse there was before, it's quadrupled. Um, it was a um, waitress, wake person. Um, Parked in front of my store for eight hours a day. Every day this last week's been parked eight hours on Main Street. And um, I just feel like we have to do something. We're right here in our season. We made it through. And um, I feel sort of like the captain that was on the major shipping ve vessel. And he uh, sent a cable to um, New York and said, we're taking on water. Um, serious situation here and they cabled back from corporate and said don't worry the bilge pumps will save you and um, from 2,000 miles away and I've spoken many times about the parking uh, asked to rev up the amount of time that it's that it's enforced extending the period and now uh, if I'm told by the police department they're no longer enforcing it um, we're, um, we're in deep tapioca. Uh, I, 
I have spoken to Aaron, and as far as, as, as I'm concerned, it is still enforceable, and then I'll, we'll make sure that that does take place starting tomorrow. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Ms. Gigi Poole. Good evening, Ms. Poole. Good evening, Mr. Sellers. I'm Gigi Poole, 147 Dogwood Lane. And I would like to speak about legacy. The legacy trail, the legacy of Shane, our new permanent, we hope long permanent town manager, the council, and the citizens. Um, the first time this was noticed was January 2nd of this year that the steps in front of Stories Carpet, former Stories Carpet, was closed. And um, that um, several people in my neighborhood, I live in Laurel Park, there are over 75 households on Laurel Park and Dogwood Lane and Quail Hollow down there. So now those 75 households at least are being forced to walk in the street to the town. Instead of being able to go on the legacy trail that we spent, I know it was bond money or special surplus money that was spent last year to improve that trail and so on March 5th, there was a meeting here that I know the interim manager attended, the interim police chief attended, and both of my neighbors that are beside me on Main Street. My property goes all the way from Dogwood Lane to Main Street. And um, the police chief said in this meeting that there has never been an incident or an injury resulting from anyone coming down those steps. They have been there for over 75 years. There has never been an incident. At that same meeting, he also said that we do know that that is a place on Main Street where it is subject to fog and that after we are 20 miles per hour here it goes up to 25 before you get you know to stories and so they're speeding and so you know we're we're past the six month mark i know our interim manager has left and we're not putting pressure on shane but um for something that's worked for 75 years and you know I've sent emails, we've asked for this meeting, and it's, oh, we'll do something, we'll do something, we'll do something. Well, so I go back to the, you know, I've sent emails, we've asked for this meeting, and it's, oh, we'll do something, we'll do something, we'll do something. Well, so I go back to the source. I always go back to the source. And the source was that our interim manager um, asked the insurance adjuster to walk around town and see if things, anything looked, you know, iffy or whatever, and that was the result, and that's why this um, trail was blocked off. So, who's running our town? Is it an insurance adjuster? Is it a lawyer? I mean, are we scared of these people? Do we need to have a lawyer that comes in and says, we've never had an incident the way it was. You've now, with closing off these steps, you have presented an issue that for over 75 household owners and, and you know people who live there is forcing us to walk on Main Street. And so I've heard, we're working on it, we're working on it. Um, you, you've done something for the Methodist Church. You've at least put, you know, little rubber things down on Saturday night and you take them down on Sunday night. Help me out. I can't do this. I need y'all. Who are we scared of? And what's our legacy? 
Thank you, Ms. Fool, and Mr. Fox, you'll look into that for you. All right, now we have the Hunger and Health Coalition. Chris Hatton. <laughs> Guys, thank you for coming this evening. Thank you for having us. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having us. Is this on? Can you folks hear okay? I'm Elizabeth Young. Um, everybody can hear okay? Good. Um, I'm Elizabeth Young. I'm the executive director with the Hunger and Health Coalition, and Chris Hatton, our board chair. <laughs> We're gonna have fun tonight. <laughs> so, uh, Mayor, Council, thank you so much for giving us this, this amazing opportunity to officially talk to this many folks. This is awesome. Um, Mr. Fox, welcome. Thank you. We're glad to have you here in the high country. And I want to start off by telling you just a, a really quick personal story. So, um, by trade, I'm a police officer, and during my 21 years, uh, I got into law enforcement because I love people. But during my 21 years, I have seen people in a lot of different states, happy, sad, damaged, renewed. And because I care so much about people, when I see people who are sad, and I see people, when, when, a, when a person reaches the point where they can't provide basic needs for themselves or worse, their loved ones, it causes a state of desperation that's just really hard to watch. And so because of that, that's how I get to the Hunger Coalition initially when I moved here. And when I got to the Hunger Coalition, I found the most wonderful group of people that I've ever seen in one building, the mayor. And so if you guys aren't familiar with the Hunger Coalition, I see some heads now. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys don't know about the Hunger Coalition, you need to find out for your, for your own good. Um, so, so we, the staff there is amazing, the people there are amazing, the mission is amazing. If you don't know who we are, we're going to go into some details here with a PowerPoint, but we are, a, for the most, the biggest part, we're a food pantry, we're a free pharmacy, no controlled substances, we're talking about blood pressure medicine, heart medicine, that kind of thing. Guys, when you meet an elderly widow, um, thinking of one person in particular, who needs five, six hundred dollars worth of medicine in a month, and meanwhile their check is seven or eight hundred dollars that month, how is that going to work? It's not going to. It's not going to work. And so it's this organization, this is why I believe so strongly, this organization uh, is the person that sort of stands in that gap and helps, helps fill that need. And so uh, we do a lot of good. You're going to see all that in this PowerPoint. But we have got a problem. Um, the problem that, in my experience with Hunger Coalition, we've never had before, but it, it's a huge problem. And that is that currently this year we are adding people, new clients at a rate we haven't seen before. Uh, we're seeing over 30 new people a month, new people, not, not the people that are coming once a month or every month. We're seeing 30 new, new people. I mean, that's when I say people, I mean clients and families, not just single people. It's not sustainable. It won't work. Uh, we're the biggest food pantry in this area, and uh, so we have a plan, and that's what this is about, but it's going to take your help. Thanks, guys. I do see a lot of familiar faces out there, so we have a lot of people that volunteer with us regularly. I thank you so much for your, your time and love that you share with us. And I'll just quickly echo um, Chris's sentiments. We've got a great crew. I mean, the most warm and loving bunch that I think you will find. So we encourage all of you to come and spend time with us, get to know our team. Uh, we do a lot of great work we'll tell you about. So we've been around since 1981 for a long time. We continue to grow. Uh, many of you um, enjoy the beauty of blowing rock and beyond it's a gorgeous place to live uh, we're blessed with a lot of different resort communities um, but a lot of what we don't see um, is the poverty that's here so uh, Boone is the third or Watauga County I'm sorry is the third poorest county in North Carolina so we have a lot of people that are working in the service industry that are working these resort um, jobs working you know minimum wage working uh, multiple jobs trying to care for their family and that's where we come in Thank you. We have a host of different programs that we offer and lots of different ways that you can plug in with us. So we have our two flagship programs, our food programs and our pharmacy programs. Um, just to see a show of hands, how many people are familiar with us? A lot. All right. All right. 
Um, so with our food programs, we have our non-perishable food pantry. That's where we give out canned goods. When you're doing the postal service drive, that's where those goodies go. Um, we also give out dairy products and meat products as they're available um, in that particular section. We have our, um, if you can go back just one more, thank you, thank you. Staying vigilant. Um, on, our fresh market is where we give out fresh produce. So we started, a donor felt really strongly about uh, brainstorming with us a few years ago, maybe four years ago, um, and started to give funds to purchase food directly from local farmers to keep money here in the area. So a large facet of our produce that we give out in our fresh market um, comes from right here in Watauga County, right here in the high country. And that's something that we're really, really proud proud of. Um, so we give out produce in that area as well as baked goods, um, herbs, smoothies from time to time. Um, our food recovery kitchen we're also really proud of. That's where we give out to-go meals. Uh, many of you have worked in that area, thank you. Um, and so we're very proud of that. That's where we um, put get food from local restaurants, the university, Samaritan's Purse that would otherwise land in the trash um, and are able to repurpose it for take-home meals for our clients. Uh, we have a simple gesture. We'll share a little bit more um, about that program with you later on. Uh, we have our backpack program. Maybe some of you are familiar with that. It's our childhood hunger program to make sure children are given a secure source of food for weekends and school breaks. Um, we just became a countywide program. That's one of, I believe, only two or three in the state, which is a very, very big deal. Blowing Rock signed on just earlier this year. Um, and there's a steep cost to maintaining that program. It's about $80,000 a year. So if you feel really called to childhood hunger, we certainly need your assistance to maintain that program. Uh, we have the Healthy Start program. That's where we give out food to the Head Start kiddos. Uh, we have Snacks for Scholars. That's healthy snack bags that are available at any time to the kids that come in our building. Um, we all know if you're hungry, you're not paying attention to what's going on, especially learning. So we want to make sure everybody has that strong start. Uh, we have our Red Hat Bags. That's a tailored program for senior women. Um, and our Western Watauga Food Outreach. So that's a, a collaborative program to provide a community meal out in the Sugar Grove area. Uh, with our pharmacy, um, we'll share a little bit more about that as it goes on. As Chris was mentioning, um, none of these are controlled medications. So we're giving out um, insulin that is $300 a vial. Uh, we're giving out inhalers if you have asthma, um, other um, breathing conditions that are $300 a pop, uh, heart medications, um, antibiotics, you name it. Um, we gave out $3.5 million worth of medication last year alone. That continues to grow year after year after year. Uh, we have our prescription assistance program that connects people that need brand name medication that would otherwise be out of reach. So uh, an example of one of these is a hepatitis C medication that costs $1,000 per pill that you're required to take for a three month time frame. Um, and we've had, I, I believe, about 20 people that have come off that program as testing uh, negative for hepatitis C. We're very, very, very proud of that. Um, and then we have some additional services. We have a Thanksgiving meal. We have a sharing tree program. That's a basic needs gift program for seniors and children 17 and under. Uh, we have a woodlot. So if you have any trees fall on your property, we can come and pick those up. Or if you, um, you you're welcome to drop them off as well. So we use that for uh, folks that are clients that use that for heating or cooking. And then we have a mattress program. So if you have any mattresses that you're tired of um, that are clean, uh, we would love to have them and give them to families that are sleeping multiple people to a mattress. Uh, we serve people that are um, at or below 200% of the poverty level. Um, that changes depending on family size. And for our food program, we serve only Watauga County. For our pharmacy, we serve Ash, Avery, and Watauga County. Albert, I let you out earlier. I'm sorry. You were the original person to invite us here. Thank you so much for that. Sorry, everybody was sitting there. I forgot. So uh, let's see just a few of these stats real quick. You guys are
back me up on that. Is it not the most precious thing you've ever seen in your life? Um, so, Elizabeth talked about Snacks for Scholars. You see the, the stat there for that one, the backpack program. Uh, this is to help kids that are going home that are food insecure and got the whole weekend to get by, to get through. Uh, it's not, maybe not like your house or my house. It's not, it's not as plentiful in everybody's house as it is in mine. So, 3,191 of those given out. And if I may, that will continue to grow. So we about doubled our size with the backpack program. We are serving or giving out about 350 backpacks per week. So you'll see that increase quite a bit. Look at that number of prescriptions that Mary Summer right there. That's a lot of prescriptions, folks. That's a lot of prescriptions. So retail value of, of those medicines over three, three and a half million dollars. Uh, prescription assistance, you got to see that. Um, so the wood lot over, uh, that says loads of wood, especially means a truckload, 461 truckloads of wood going to folks who need that. Um, if you've ever burned wood or you're cold and needed wood, you know how important a truckload of wood would be to you. So, uh, the sharing tree, 556 individuals were served over the holiday. Those are folks who would not have had a very good holiday uh, but for the donors of the Hunger Coalition and, and the staff there. So we've got some stats here. We're just going to breeze through it for the sake of time. We've got one in four children that are hungry here in the high country. That's in comparison to one in five statewide. Uh, and then just quickly, I'll, I'll say um, we've got 78% of uh, folks here in Watauga County have had to choose between food and medical care. Um, so we have a lot of disparities. We know transportation's an issue. Uh, we've got lots of, lots of different expenses up here. And if you'll... Um, and then I wanted to tell you quickly, um, so in addition, we know we need these foundational programs. We know people are struggling. We're, we're also looking at innovative solutions to try to adapt to the need. Um, one of those is a simple gesture. This is our newest program, and we are so excited about it. And um, I don't know if you guys knew, we've got a special guest star in the house tonight. We've got Vanna White, but she <laughs> left her gown at home. <laughs> so Vanna is here with us. Um, just kidding. Her name is Jen Bass. She's our master, Master's in Public Administration intern with us this summer. We're very lucky to have her. Um, so the way that this program works is people sign up as food donors. Um, and we ask that all of you do that tonight, okay? We, we need you. We definitely need your help. So when you sign up as a food donor, you're given one of these very attractive bags. Beautiful, y'all. I mean, so green, it just pops. Yes. I know. You're going to look good. You are going to look good. And so um, you sign up uh, and get a bag. And then um, we ask that you fill the bag every time that you shop for you or your family with one extra item for someone in need. And when you sign up, uh, we'll give you a sign-up form. You can also sign up online. Um, we will leave uh, some goodies just outside the door. So um, I ask of you, I plead with you, if you would please sign up for this program, leave your sheets behind, and perhaps one of these guys, Jim Steele, could help us with that on the way out and gather them for us. Um, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> that would be great. So um, we all have to come together as a community. So... Uh, the idea is that you fill your, your bag up with one extra item for people in need, and then at the end of every two months, we will send you a reminder to leave it on your front door. We then have a team of volunteer drivers that will show up at your home. They will call you first and let you know every two months, and this information is also listed on the bag. Um, you just leave it outside, and then the drivers will leave you with a replacement bag, and the process starts all over again. Um, and so this is a continuous canned food drive. We modeled it after a program in Greensboro that has been wildly successful. Over about three years, they were able to raise about a million pounds of food. And so, you know, we're a different community than Greensboro. We know that we're smaller. But our hope is uh, that we can uh, fill our shelves with the food that we need. It's flying off the shelves in rates that I haven't seen in five years. And then uh, we're really looking to become a medical model for food as medicine. So people that have various medical conditions can come to us and get exactly what they need. And then we hope to be living in abundance where we can share with other pantries. Now, we're the biggest pantry here in the high country, but we want to share with everybody. Um, and so if you can... 
skip on through. Um, we've got some flyers that Jen could pass out if you don't mind. Um, and so you can sign up online. We'd love for you to sign up this evening. We'll leave a stack of bags. Um, when you do sign up, you must um, be sure to list all of your contact information. That's how we'll stay in touch with you. We won't be pesty. We're not going to sell it to anybody. Nothing crazy. So uh, your name, address, email, and telephone number. And you can take a bag and, um, and carry on that way. So um, I will say another program that um, is really exciting that I wanted to share with you all we started a food insecurity screening tool with the hospital in 2017. That was uh, the third program only of its kind in the state. And how it works when anybody comes in the hospital, they are screened for food insecurity. Should they flag as struggling to meet their most basic of needs, they're given a referral to come see us and other pantries for ongoing care. And then they're um, discharged with an 18 pound food box. So we've just gotten the blessing from the uh, ARA, uh, the hospital foundation um, to expand that to every Every medical office that they touch in Watauga County, y'all, this is big. So we are soon going to have the first countywide food and security screening tool um, in the nation. So it's really, really significant. So uh, I want to underscore that we are always looking to innovative solutions. If you live in other areas or have other ideas, please come to us and share that with us. And I'll be quick. Okay. So, so let me synopsize this again. Here's what we need to do. Fill out a very brief little form while you're grocery shopping, pick up a couple extra cans of, of whatever, walk it to your front porch. That's all we're asking you to do. We will come pick it up and give you even an empty bag, and then you're ready to go again. It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple. And this program has got the potential of resolving or definitely helping the, the deficiency that I was talking about. And I'd like to say, too, with the program, A Simple Gesture, or ASG as we call it, we are actively looking for volunteers. So if you feel called to participate in the community in this way, we certainly need your help. We have a leadership team of concerned citizens, so we, we need help in that capacity for sure. Uh, we also have on our designated Saturdays, again, that's every two months, um, we have few people that help us to sort the food. Um, so it's a, about a 9 until 2 o'clock commitment, but you can also come and go if you need to and then we're also looking for volunteer drivers so if you and a friend or a loved one would be willing to go and have a designated pickup route we map it out in advance for you and make it very very easy so we certainly need help um, and then I'd like to ask for those of you that might be connected to a business or another organization or civic group or faith group we would love the opportunity to come and give a presentation um, and get more people involved. So I thank you very much for your time tonight. Um, and again, we'll leave the sign-up sheets just out the door here with a bag. Now, if you get the bag, be sure to leave a sign-up sheet. Otherwise, we will not know to pick it up at your home. Okay? So we know tonight's a serious night, but let's do this smile one more time. Woo! Thank you so much. Thank you. And I think they ought to be commended for what they do. Uh, I, I think Watauga County has some dire need, and uh, uh, thank you so very much, guys. Well, moving forward. Okay, this is a the continuation of the CUP 2019. Miss Sweeting, thank you. 2019-01 uh, Rainy Lodge hearing. Now, uh, if I must say, please uh, respect um, what we've had to deal with, and that is we have this discussion is strictly among council. And so uh, this has been a very tough situation for all of us, council and citizens. And um, so I would, I'm, I'm sure you all will all respect the council's comments and uh, refrain from any comments yourselves. So moving forward, council, who would like to lead off with any discussion? Uh, I'll make a motion. Doug, you would like to make a motion? It will lead us into the discussion, I hope. Okay. Uh, I hope you'll bear with me. It's fairly lengthy. So. Okay. Could you speak uh, up a little bit, Doug? Oh, sorry about that. I'd like to make a motion to approve the application for a conditional use permit 
based on the evidence presented at the quasi-judicial hearings held on April 9, 2019 and May 14, 2019. This motion is to approve is based on the evidence presented at these hearings and is set forth in the applicant's proposed findings, which were submitted to our town council by the applicant's attorney. I will reference my motion, the numbered paragraphs and subparagraphs in the applicant's proposed findings. The evidence proposed, the evidence presented supports the following findings. One, the applicant's application is complete based on the testimony of the town planning director, Kevin Rothrock. The use or development is located, designed, and proposed to be operated so as to maintain or promote the public health, safety, and general welfare. In support of this finding, I would rely upon and refer to paragraph two, subparagraphs one through nine, which are set forth in the applicant's proposed findings. Three, the use or development complies with all required regulations and standards of the land use ordinance and with all our applicable regulations. In support of these findings, I would rely upon paragraph three, subparagraphs one through 14 of the applicant's proposed findings. Four, the use or development is located, designed, and proposed to be operated so as to be compatible with the particular neighborhood in which it is located. In support of these findings, I would rely upon paragraph four, subparagraphs one through 12 of the applicant's proposed findings. The use, number five, the use or development will not substantially injure the value of adjoining or a budding property. In support of this finding, I would rely upon paragraph five, subparagraphs one through nine of the applicant's proposed findings. Number six, the use or development conforms with the general plans for the physical development of the town as embodied in this ordinance, the town of Boyne Rock's comprehensive plan, and in any other duly adopted plans of the town. In support of this finding, I would rely upon paragraph six, subparagraphs one through six of the applicant's proposed findings. I would further move that the proposed town of Boyne Rock conditional use permit as drafted by the town planning director and made part of a record be approved subject to the following specific conditions. That approval of this permit will be conditioned upon the restriction that due to the classification of Morningside Drive under a code of ordinances, all deliveries made to the project after completion will be limited to trucks having no more than two axles. Two, I ask that prior to commencement of any land disturbing activity, the applicant shall provide a performance bond or payment to the town to cover 125% of the applicant's estimated cost as approved by the town engineer. Of the installation of the project stormwater drainage facilities, water and sewer utilities, sidewalks, full site stabilization, the proposed project landscaping and restoration of all excavated areas to be pre-disturbance grade level to be used by the town as recommended by the town engineer and the town planning director based upon progress of completion of the project at the time the performance bond or payment is utilized. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Doug. Do we have a second? I'll second that. We have discussion on this matter. I'd like to suggest that we add it for your consideration, part of your amendment, that the applicant provide working, obviously working drawings, not only for the project of the building, but I'd also like to see the landscape drawings. And I'd like to have those drawings 
uh, be in concert with the rendering that was that was shown to us, so that we know that what we're going to get there, and that would be part and parcel of this project, and that we do not issue any building permit until we get those obviously those plans and they've been approved. And then secondly, that there would be no certificate of occupancy conveyed until 100% of those plans are done. So we're not saying some, you understand what I mean by that? Mm. Okay. So I'd like to have you consider that as, as an part of your motion if you if you all think it's worthwhile. Doug, would you like that habit you add it to that? your motion? Uh, so you're, you're yeah. saying that's going to be contingent. Are you making this contingent on that? No, I just think it's, I'm just offering it as a, I'm just offering it as, as something that I, that I personally. Well, how can we approve tonight if we don't have it to look at you? I don't understand question. your question. He didn't make it contingent on, but he made it as one of the statutes limitations for the uh, developer before they can open yeah, the facility perfect. for sale. Yeah. Okay. And I would just say, if you want to put that in, in, in the thing, it might be nice. Otherwise, what you've done is already. It's I have no problem with it. I feel like that's in here. The landscaping plan where you said on number four. Yeah, and it may. Um, it, it's in here, rely upon paragraph four, subparagraph one through 12. Um, the landscape plan and renderings, number 10 of that one through 12, it says um, the landscaping plan and renderings showing the species to be used was designed to match the actual specimens commonly found in the area. Are you looking for more than that? I just would like to have a finished landscape plan that is part of the project. Not something that, well, it sort of looks like this. Right. No, I want to see the, and then Kevin and, and our landscape guy can take a look at it and say, yeah, it looks like the picture we see. That's pretty close. So, okay. So in paragraph 11 of the conditional use permit that's been drafted as okay. part of this motion. Is that part of it? Said, it says the applicant um, I didn't shall, notice that it shall, com, shall uh, submit a complete landscape plan for review and okay. approval by the city right, administrator prior to issuance of building the grading permit. All right, fine then. That's covered. Thanks. I didn't catch that. Ms. Powell? Um, so I'm just put, piecing this together of what Doug. Um, because as everyone probably knows, we can't, we haven't talked about this. We haven't talked about this with y'all. We've had to walk away. We've had to not take phone calls, not look at emails. We've not been able to talk to the public about this. We can't talk about this until tonight either. So this is the first I've seen, we've seen of this from us from Doug, and I'm piecing together what he's done here, um, and it looks pretty comprehensive. Um, some of the things that came up to me, because um, we're, uh, and, and I don't know if, if we need to add this in, or, um, or not, um, but some of my concerns, um, and, and maybe I just need some reassurances, were um, the noise, since we're gonna be, um, this proper, this um, development will have outdoor um, uh, restaurant and probably music, um, and we've got neighborhoods surrounding it. Um, I just kind of wanted to talk 
talk through what our noise ordinances are and how we would control any of that. Um, I know that we already have, and it might be something that, um, you know, it's a hotel, so they're not going to have loud noise probably anyway. It would shoot themselves in the foot um, for the guests that are, um, but I didn't know if we needed to add anything on, onto that. Um, what's our current noise, after hour noise ordinance? in regards to um, bands playing outside or music outside or dumping trash. Can, can we just review that real quick? Certainly, so, so yep. it is broken out. The, the ordinance for food and, and beverage consumption is, is no later than 12. And so between the hours of 12 and 7 a.m., 12 p.m. and or 12, 12 a.m. and 7 a.m., um, the, the other that you refer to, the music, um, outdoor music, uh, loudness, uh, yelling, that type of thing is, is 11 to 7, so 11 p.m. to, to 7 a.m. So those, that's the current ordinance, um, and, and trash falls in line with that also. I know that um, because I enjoy music on the lawn, that the Ragged Inn, they seem to finish theirs up about 8.30 or so. And I don't know if that's because they're a hotel and they're being, um, you know, but that's not part of our ordinance. Where's Kevin? <clears throat> Mr. Rothrock, the, um, is, is there any reason in our code that um, Blowing Rock kind of goes quiet around 8.30, 9.30 at the latest? Yeah. Is in it the code? No, it just, that's what it, it just is. naturally <laughs> does? <Yeah. laughs> yeah. the, uh, just all that old? <laughs> uh, we did make, you were talking about Rob's down there where they have music on the lawn, and uh, we did add some provisions on decibel levels at 65 decibels, I think it was. Okay, is as that? As that got going and got more popular, there was some complaints as it drifted up the mountain. Um, that's in, there's some stipulation, I think Aaron has, has done some monitoring of that. I know Tony did when he was chief. Is that monitored on their property or on the neighboring property? Across the street at school. That's where at it had school? been. Yeah. I think there's something in there about being across the street or within a certain distance. Um, the town code regulates noise and things. And as, as Shane mentioned, service not beyond 12 o'clock out if, if it's outside. Uh, we used to have, we amended that because we used to have problems at Tijuana Fats. Uh, and, and the other problem they had was dumping of recyclables late at night, one o'clock in the morning. And so that's restricted to 11. So, and you also got speckled trout and mellow mushroom in the same vicinity. So, uh, well, they're all regular. I enjoy um, local night on Thursday nights at speckled trout, and that seems to wrap up about nine o'clock too. Yeah. I mean, we all seem to kind of. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot different from PB Scott's days. It's just a lot quieter. <laughs> Um, and, and like I said, that that would might be just naturally something that they're not going to keep going late in the hours because they're that hotel did. guests. There. That's right. And so their own guests would monitor that. But I didn't know if we needed to bring that up. Are the rules in the neighborhood as far as um, versus central business um, different for noise? No, it's town wide. Town wide. Yeah. Okay, so if the dog's barking or... Oh, yeah, it's town-wide. Okay, so midnight. <clears throat> and I think at one time in the noise ordinance we had a thing on amplified sound. I guess that's at 11 also. Uh, yes. That we, you know, to strike, you know, electric guitars, you know, any amplified type music. Right. I think it's 11. Okay. Another, um, another question that I had um, or something I wanted to discuss was um, especially with the 13 inches of rain we just had was how this would affect um, the storm drain and runoff. And if I remember right, help me remember, it's been months um, and, and I don't know if y'all know, we had 500 pages of minutes Ten hours of deliberations over this that we have been looking at for the town. Um, there is 
there's going to be a new stormwater basin under this property that is an improvement, that is bigger. Can you help me understand? Because what I wanted was gravel, and that makes no sense. Um, probably with right. pushing snow around or whatever needs to happen in uh, 53 parking spaces. But how can how how we got it set up to be proactive for a storm, you know, rain like we had this past weekend? Um, well, the stormwater detention is designed in such a way to capture all that falls on the property and is detained underground because they're going beyond the standard 36 percent their volume increases uh, substantially uh, cubic cubic feet of storage of stormwater it's released at a rate uh, prescribed in the ordinance um, slower you know so it would if it's full it would take maybe 24 hours to 36 hours to drain out and not all at once uh, if there's an too much rain, it's full, the system's full, it's designed to overflow and just enter into the stormwater system. That's why all the detention that's been built since in the last 25 years is designed to do the same thing. Um, this weekend, it would be full, and it would be just like everywhere else, and it would be uh, bypass, it would be full in the system and eventually bypass and get into the storm drain on the street. You can't do anything with that much. There's no, there's no way to design it. It would be impractical to design something that would handle that kind of storm. But for a normal storms, uh, a summer storm, normal rainfall, it's designed to accommodate that and would be better when completed than it is today. Um, I have two more things. Y'all bear with me. <clears throat> um, we've talked about how this property faces. And... To me, it sounds like it's going to face Morningside. When you go up in up Morningside and turn into the property, that's your entrance. In fact, and I wish the model was here. I'm the one that requested for the model to come back. I'm very visual. So there, um, in understanding the property and. Um, right, thank you. Okay, so that's the side, that's the side, that's the side, back that's side. Right. Keep going. That was it. The front is right there. Uh, that's, that's rainy. Is that side. rainy? That's the front. That's, that's the front door. The lobby. Come in more inside, it's the front. Um, when I go somewhere um, and travel and we're heading down to the coast this weekend, um, I put it in my GPS and I don't look at signs until I get to the property and then I'm like, oh, yes, this is Rainy Lodge. And I expect <clears throat> there to be some kind of Rainy Lodge or something on the front of that building. But I, um, I don't think it would be appropriate to be on the side of the building. I think... Um, and, and I know our signs, um, we have strict sign rules, but I don't think we have, I don't think um, we have that. I think people just naturally are um, more subdued in Blowing Rock with their signs. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know that um, we need to have that added to this, or if you'll just follow what the rest of Blowing Rock does. I think you're going to need a sign. Uh, uh, on the road, you know, that like we all have, there's, you know, <coughs> along Main Street and from my office, there's a sign, you know, and then there's a sign on the front. Um, or Holiday Inn has a sign and then a sign on the front of the building. But I, I would not expect a sign on the side, on either of the other sides of the property. Um, it, it didn't look like on the, um, on the model that you were going to put Rainy Lodge on every side of that building, I think it would not uh, fall in, um, along with the neighborhood or along with the rest of town because we don't have signs on every side of the building. But that was something that I thought of. 
The last thing that um, that I noticed in reading through all of this information um, is a question for you. Um, they're going to give us a easement for their, we have a sewer line or something. Do we need to have that re-recorded in the deed or somehow? How's that going to be? How, how are we going to have that in place? Because there's a line that runs in there that's going to be reconfigured. How are we going to have that as a... Um, I think that's covered in uh, that, item you know six of the about? CUP that requires them to provide an easement once that line is put through the property. The easement goes it to the town. The the yeah. It is? Okay. I just want to make sure that was in there. Um, because right now we don't have it. It runs through the property and we don't have an easement. No. I mean, we can fix it. Okay. We have prescriptive easement rights, but there's no, I don't believe there's anything recorded, but when this is changed over and moved back out to Morningside through the site, um, we'll have an easement. And it says the sewer easement must be CUPs, we are bound by what our ordinances are and what the laws are. We don't get to pick and choose which ones we like and we don't like. So this particular applicant met all the things that our ordinances call for. He owns the property. It's his property. And um, so it seems to me we are bound to, based upon fact, we're bound to let him build it. Uh, one thing that I can also, some unintended consequences may be that we're going to be diligent, I hope, to see that all those conditions are met. That the parking by contractors and subs are not on the streets during the day and blocking and, and blocking access. Because the streets are narrow enough as it is. I live on a street that is narrow like those. And the contractors have to find a place to park because they're not parking on the streets. So that's going to be. Same thing with all the, it's the same thing with all the building materials. Got to be stored on that property. I don't know how that's going to get done. But they can't impinge on anybody else's property. That's part of the rule. So I just wanted to explain I just wanted to explain that to you. And a very interesting. We have to, when we deliberate like this, we have to look out for all stakeholders, not just a small, you know, not just a neighborhood, but everybody, to see that their rights are also met. So I just wanted to let you know that that was the biggest thing for us, was that it was the right thing to do because it's the law and it's our ordinances. Um, Whether you like it or not. Albert? Well, that flies in the face of why we invented lawyers. I'm going to speak to you in the vernacular of a guy from Catawba County whose only absence from North Carolina was in the U.S. Navy 
on a ship like you just saw buzz by the Russians. Take my word for it, you haven't heard the last of that one. Uh, I've known the developer, Steve, how long, Steve? Had quite a few intellectual conversations with him. He does not have horns. His zoning guy, Walter Fields, there is the absolute best hired gun I ever met. <laughs> he, he is. Uh, but we just have a little difference of opinion. And it's honest with me, and I know with you. Uh, I just think the thing is too hot in the air, and it's just too massive for right there. And I think it's going to look like a cross between uh, Sugar Top and Helen, Georgia. That's what I think. Uh, but I'm not going to be one of those guys, obviously, you have to be brain dead not to know this thing's going to pass right now. I'm not going to be out there throwing rocks at you. I'm going to be available to help you any way I can and that you want to make it best that we can make it for our town because it's going to be there. And I'm counting on you to do all the things that this thing says you're going to do that Miss Garrett put together, who I know well she's represented me before. She's done a fine job. So that's all i got to say, gentlemen, and thank you for here. Well, first off, I want to say, a lot of you knew I grew up here, younger years, many years ago. And politics is new to me. All I've known is business. And um, when it came down to the situation with Miss Sweeting, that greatly disappointed me. Great, greatly disappointed every councilwoman and councilman. But we learned a valuable lesson. We have rules, we have ordinances, we have protocol, we have to follow. And when we're up here, we're here to represent everybody. And we have to follow the letter of the law. And we all, you guys, us, we've lost a lot of sleep over this. I will follow suit with Albert and say, I hope that you gentlemen follow and go above and beyond, not in height. <laughs> what the project should look like. Because once, if this happens, once it happens, you've got to keep in mind, you're an important part of the town of Blowing Rock, okay? So, any other comments? Well, I, I, um, there, this project, unfortunately, um, has um, brought out the worst in some of us. And um, as we're moving forward, um, I expect Rainy Lodge to be a good neighbor. I'm gonna be a good neighbor to Rainy Lodge. This whole, we have an opportunity on this side of town to blossom and Rainy Lodge is gonna be a part of that. We've got a new sidewalk from Main Street to Bass Lake. Cone Manor, to town, to Shatola, to the mountains to see, to the Blue Ridge Parkway, to Boone. It's going to be amazing, and Rainy Lodge is going to be a part of that. And um, it's, it's going to be walkable. I expect the people that park um, and that are guests at Rainy Lodge will stay parked there and walk all over town. Um, I, I expect, I'd like to expect you all to welcome this development. Um, just like we welcome the summer people back as locals. Every year we welcome y'all back. Just like we welcome the down the mountain people on the mountain. 
Um, we can turn this into a positive. We can work together. I think Blowing Rock is moving forward. This is an opportunity. And I think we can move forward together. Done. Any more comments, guys? All right. Those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? No. Motion passes. We will take a 10 minute recess. this meeting back in session. Oh, all right, uh, financial monthly report. Nicole, how are you? Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm here tonight to review with you um, our financial report for period ending May 31st, 2019. This is approximately 92% into fiscal year 18-19. As of the date of this report, 2018 property tax collections total $4,273,802, which is 102% of the budget. This is about 6% more than last fiscal year and 1% above budget pace of last year. Motor, motor vehicle taxes at this time total $77,147. Um, that's about 96% of budget collected to date uh, for the 10 months collected at this point in the fiscal year. This is 7% more than last fiscal year at this time. Sales tax collections total $1,360,370 or 75% of collections. This is through March, um, which is nine months collected to date. This is 3% higher than last year's collections at this time. Building permits total 67,312 or 96% of budget. Zoning fees total 9,408 or 94% of budget. Water service charges through five of our six main billings total 736,758. This is 78% of budget. This is 2% higher than collections um, last year at this time, but about 8% below budget pace compared to last, last year at this time. Um, whereas sewer service charges through the same time period, five of the six main billings, total 616,223 or 83% of budget. This is in line with last year's budget pace and about 4% higher collections than last year at this time. Water connection fees total 23,550 or 139% of budget. This is the same as last month. Um, while sewer connection fees total 41,964, this is 262% of budget, and this is slightly higher than last month. Overall expenditures for the general fund are at 82%. This is about 1% below last year at this time, whereas general fund revenues are at 87%, 3% below last year at this time. Overall expenditures for the water fund are at 68%. This is 8% below budget pace of a typical year where the revenues are at 69% and 6% below a typical year. So we are closing in on some of our water sewer fund revenues here at the end of the year. However, we are projected to be under budget in this revenue source. Departments are in line with budget at this time. Um, as an accounting note, I will mention that due to a system change in our Parks and Recreation <coughs> Department with their revenue posting, um, there is a understatement of revenues on this May report. However, it's expected to be corrected on the June financial report. Um, and also, as a note on the water sewer revenues, we are keeping an eye on those declines. Um, other department notes on our bond financing. Um, we looked at forecasting um, out of our projected expenditures on the Sunset Drive project, and it was determined that um, it would be best with funds on hand um, to go ahead and, and plan on not issuing those funds until next fiscal year. Um, and we will have more planning sessions on the, uh, the remaining phases of the budget in the near future. And budget work is continuing with 
we are now revisiting areas based on some council feedback and end of the year um, projections that are currently developing. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions, guys? No. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fox, I think you're going to address ordinance amendment, chapter 13 cemeteries. Yes, sir. Uh, Mayor, council, um, good evening again. Um, tonight, I bring before you a proposed amendment to the town ordinance, um, two town ordinances, uh, 1318 and 1319, uh, regarding our cemetery. Um, it's been requested, uh, I believe, by several members of this board to amend the current ordinance to allow upright markers or headstones. Um, after extensive discussions and, and due diligence, uh, myself, uh, Interim Director Matt Blackburn, um, have developed or, or, or proposed here um, some changes um, to the, those two amendments or the amendments to those two um, ordinance, uh, ordinances, 8, 1318 and 1319, um, to allow um, upright single and double markers. And so tonight I've got a just a quick uh, presentation here to show some guidelines that um, we were able to obtain by discussing this particular topic with our main two vendors um, um, and, and put together some guidelines for your consideration tonight. Um, currently, as you know, um, outside of section one, the other six sections of the cemetery um, do not allow upright markers, only flat um, markers. Um, what we've proposed here are both single and double um, upright markers. Um, first, I'll start with a single marker. Um, this would show the marker itself not to exceed um, the die itself. The die is the, upper, the, upper, the upright section. The die not to exceed two to two and a half feet wide. Um, the base no more than three to three and a half feet. Um, the overall width of the base no larger than one and a half feet wide and the overall height of the upright die not to exceed three feet in height. Um, this again is in uh, relation to the research that was done by our main two vendors that um, uh, we work with uh, currently to, to place the um, bases at the cemetery. Um, the double marker dimensions obviously are larger. Um, base stays the same at one and a half feet wide overall. Um, no more than five, or no, no less than five, no more than six feet wide at the overall base. Um, four feet wide restriction would be for the double die marker, um, and then not to exceed three feet in height. Um, questions that I obviously ask during the due diligence process regarding maintenance, um, upkeep of this particular change. Um, currently, we, we, are, we are not mowing over the flat markers, and so we are currently weed eating um, as, as needed um, every two weeks around each one of those bases. And so this particular change in the ordinance or amendment to the ordinance does not require additional man hours or additional uh, work to be performed in, in the upkeep of the cemetery itself. So I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. Keep, I, I think uh, you and I discussed this once and you were gonna find out uh, about existing if somebody now wants to go back and, and have this uh, an upright put down instead of a flat. Uh, what was the decision? No decision made, but currently if, if, if one is broken or if one, one needs to be replaced, it's replaced. And so that, that, that particular area has not been addressed in the ordinance prior. Um, that would be something if, if you would like to add, we could add to a particular ordinance. But, but as, as of now, it's being, it's being done. Um, it's just being done under the cur current ordinance with the restrictions as, as having a flat marker. You could do it back as wanted. Right, that's why I'm asking. If somebody wants to go and pull theirs up now and put it up, put it doing up right, then they can. Right? Is there enough yeah. width in those plots? Yes. Yeah. Each plot's a five by ten plot. So this, yeah. like I said, for the for for a single marker, um, no more than three to three and a half feet wide. So three and a half feet wide is, is the maximum for a single. Obviously, double that for a double. Um, no more than six. So the flat markers now are how? What are the dimensions of the flat markers now? Uh, the flat markers now. Um, so markers must not exceed um, 36 inches in width, um, seven feet six inches um, in length. And so seven feet. Correct. And so if you imagine a five by ten plot, it can go essentially the, the length of the plot itself. No more than seven feet six inches in length. No wider than 36 inches. So these are smaller. Than these are smaller from a base standpoint. Correct. Yeah. So you understand that that seven foot yeah, is the, the complete whole length. Length. Yeah. And, and a flat one can be that now. They can, can if be. they want them. Okay. Yeah. Current, current, like I said, plots are five by ten. Right. Um, so five by ten. Current, current ordinance um, states no longer than seven feet six inches, no wider than three feet. Got it. 
Yeah, so should we put that in there about if there's a <coughs> replacement? We certainly can. We can certainly add that. I don't see any reason if somebody wants to do it why we wouldn't let them do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's currently being followed. That's it's currently the standard. Yeah, I mean procedure. they're, they're going to put th that is the expense of that is on the on the owner of the plot. The ones in there won't care. To replace <laughs> it. <laughs> okay. You know they're dying to get in there. <laughs> oh God. Do we do we have a motion? Yeah, I make a motion. We accept it. Okay, uh, Mr. Steele makes the motion with, yeah, the, with the change. With, with the change that, uh, I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, okay. Motion so passes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fox. All right, moving forward, uh, officials' reports and comments. Well, I know there's been issue on trees on Valley Boulevard. Well. Uh, Cully Tarleton said, if y'all have any questions, call him. Well, he called me this evening. The dead trees on Valley Boulevard, some 50 of them will be removed ASAP. Okay? Secondly, new trees will start being installed on September 15th and completed on December 15th. And this also includes the medium. Okay? The medium? Medium, yes. Medium or medium? medium? Well, if you're from the south, it's medium. From the north, it's medium. <laughs> medium. It's in the, the, middle. the middle of the road. The okay. Of the road. <laughs> Sorry, Miss Powell. Um, contract a warranty on these trees will be effective December 15th and will be for 18 months. Good. Good. So from December 15th, for 18 months, if any trees die, they have to replace them. Okay, are those going to be living trees? Well, you cannot kill a dead tree. Charlie. Yes, dear. They just gave us dead trees. And they're, so they're, well, they're well aware of that. <laughs> they're well aware of that. And those trees, any trees that go in dead will be replaced or any trees that don't live will be replaced. Before December 15th? Oh, well, September. the contract does not begin till December 15th, okay? Yeah. So, yeah. Right, now, any, right, now, yeah, right now, any trees that die between now and December 15th, they're gonna replace, and then after December 15th, any trees that die, or bushes, because they're planting some rhododendrons, they're doing different things they haven't done yet. All that stuff will be warranted for 18 months, okay? And so Cully did say, if you see something that's in question, get in touch with him, okay? Uh, he's checking into the mowing. Right now, the contractor is supposed to keep that area mowed every 10 days, and he thinks up until December, but he's gonna check and see if that's extended as well, okay? Our well, they've got Sandy King believing that those dead trees are just in shock, so let's put it on CNN so she can. It could be dead. early autumn. I don't know. <laughs> That's what they've got her believe. They came and told her that. They did put some high-dollar fertilizer on there, but it's not going to bring <laughs> it's not going to bring Keith's golden oak back because it's ridiculous now. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're not dead. They're in shock. <laughs> Mr. Steele. Yes. <laughs> Any comments? No. Okay. No comments. I would like Sweet. to mention that the Land Use Ad Hoc Committee has met twice. Um, we've had uh, very productive meetings. We've come up with, uh, we're working on our scope or our purpose, but we have decided that it would be in the best interest um, for the town to actually um, hire someone to help us with the process. And we're going to, at the core, use the comprehensive plan and have um, them look at um, the plan from Main Street, Sunset, and Valley Boulevard. And our hope is that they will give us, um, this is what your options are. We are planning that they will present to the um, community 
um, some suggestions so the community can decide what it is that they want. And then they're also going to provide us with what ordinances need to be changed to protect the things that the community wants. So we're in the process of um, looking for someone, finding out how much they're going to charge, and then we'll go uh, look for some money. Good, good. Well, they don't have some set aside in that budget. We have 20000 in the current budget, but... Yeah. Yeah. Have you talked about having the um, what the community wants coming from the community, not from a consultant? Well, what we're going to do is, and, and we don't know how they're going to present it, but the idea is for them to give us some things to look at and then to show the community, and then the community can decide what they like, what they don't like. So I think we need to have something to show people, um, or without that, I think we'll have the confusion that we had with the planning board when they did what they did for Main Street. So that was our approach that we decided to come up with to try. Thank you, Sue. Doug? Uh, I've got a couple things, a uh, little update on the shuttle. Uh, one, we've had 129 riders so far. Uh, the average killed us this past weekend because of the weather. Um, they didn't have like 10 riders for the whole weekend because of the weather, so and I can understand that. Uh, a thing that I do want to bring to everybody's uh, attention and uh, the town manager and I, and I think Charlie's going to be there. We are doing a conference call Thursday. We, uh, I've sent out a thing to y'all. I hope everyone has got it on the short-term rentals. Uh, right now, there is a group in North Carolina, uh, real estate and online companies that are trying to rewrite or have language put into another law that would preempt local ordinances on short-term rental, which would allow short-term rental anywhere. So that means, like here in Blown Rock, it don't make any difference what neighborhood you're in, it's gonna be allowed. So we are trying to fight this like crazy. We have a conference call we're working with, right now with uh, the, uh, North Carolina resort towns and convention cities is, is putting on the conference call that we're going to be working with uh, Thursday to try and see a, what kind of line of defenses we're going to try and get established on this. But just for everybody's, please make sure if you're, you feel about this and you know how people feel in Bowen Rock about short-term rentals in their neighborhoods, please make sure you talk to Senator Ballard and Representative Russell and let them know how you feel. Does on George's this. group know about that? So, I don't know. We have to ask uh, that. That's where we are on that uh, right now. What time is the conference call? Uh, do you remember? I don't remember without looking back. 11, 11 on Thursday. Yeah. yeah. 11 on Thursday. Okay. Yeah, 11 to 11.30. Yeah. Um, Who's going to be talking to? Uh, we'll be engaged uh, to a degree. We have asked Kevin also, they asked for or any town that already had an ordinance. They wanted us to send their ordinance in. So in hopes that, you know, if they try and squeeze something by, if you already have, say Blowing Rock already has something down there, they say, okay, we're going to exclude Blowing Rock from this because you know they have a, you know they're fighting us hard on it and they got an ordinance and all that. But we we've asked and that our ordinance be sent down and and so they have a copy of it down there. Sue, so. So did you get the email on that? Okay, that conference call information is right down at the bottom. Okay. Okay. Thanks. It's fine. No. Okay, I did miss something, guys. I received a letter. Anytime I see a letter <laughs> in my box here, I kind of shake a little bit. And this one uh, came from a family in Nashville, Tennessee. They were staying at the Meadowbrook Inn, and this will be on file if you all want to read it in detail. I'll just skim over it. They were staying at the Meadowbrook Inn. Uh, this gentleman's wife had uh, has dementia. She had some real issues. And... Uh, 
two of our police officers showed up to assist, uh, along with uh, later the EMTs. Uh, in a nutshell, the, uh, Mr. Burns stated that uh, he felt like our police uh, went above and beyond. The EMTs were very helpful and did very well, and uh, the Meadowbrook uh, allowed them to check out earlier without any penalty and discounted them as well. So that was the letter we received. If y'all want to look at it, uh, you know, but I think it's good. It, kudos to our police and to our EMTs. Okay. Mr. Mosley. I, I, I do have just a couple quick things. Um, um, as everyone knows, it, it rained a lot this weekend. Um, almost 13 inches uh, was recorded at our wastewater treatment plant between 7 a.m. Friday and 7 p.m. Sunday, so almost 13 inches. Um, I'd like to commend uh, the police department, fire department, the public works, streets, um, water treatment plant individuals, um, and the wastewater folks. Um, collectively, this weekend between Friday night and Sunday night, um, worked approximately 100 hours of overtime. Um, or extra time to make sure that um, everyone within the town was, was kept um, as safe and as dry as they possibly could be. Um, we only had a handful of instances, luckily, thanks to some pre-measured um, work that was taking place this past week, um, and, and those, I think, have all been rectified or in the process of being rectified. So um, for me, my first week here, having the um, torrential rains that took place this weekend, I think it was a very quiet weekend for the most part, um, given the fact that we did have the folks here um, on staff to, to, to conduct the work that they did. So I'd like to commend them um, for working the extra hours and spending the time this weekend to do the work that was needed. Okay. Um, as Ms. Norman mentioned earlier, the budget process is, is still underway. Um, next Tuesday at 6, the workshop continues that we uh, recessed from last Tuesday. Um, and so Tuesday at 6, we'll continue that process. Um, and then lastly, um, just to say thank you, it's been a good first week. So I appreciate <laughs> the opportunity. Albert, did you have something else you want to say? I'll just ask the shuttles are, Doug, is, do you think we need to buy a shuttle boat? Yeah. <laughs> That'd be good. Do you yeah. ask for that to be put in the budget? I think we ought to do that. <laughs> yeah. All right. I will say, going back on the, on the short term, that I did hear back after reaching out and touching uh, uh, Representative Russell, he was very quick to respond, and he said he would be on the lookout for any language to that effect and any bills coming before him. So okay. he, he and his staff is, are working on it and are, being, are alerted to it. Okay. The day of meeting next Tuesday is to continue the process. Gotcha. And just if you have any questions or anything that you need, clarification on it. Make sure you talk to our town manager so we can get that information for us by next Tuesday. When, yeah. when are we going to have that? It's been all over the place. Six o'clock Tuesday. What date is that? Tuesday. Uh, 18th. 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 18th of six. You couldn't be here. Then. Okay. 18th. I'm not going to be here. You won't be? Right. You won't be. All right. Moving Here. forward, well, now we are going into closed session, ladies and gentlemen, uh, <coughs> under North Carolina General Statute 143-318-11A5. Uh, we will adjourn from closed session later on and then adjourn from our normal town council meeting. Uh, so if you would like to stay out in the lobby and come back in, that'd be great. Uh, Motion. I'd like to make a motion. Second. Okay. Aye. And what's the reason for it? So that it's that needs to be stated. Property uh, lease. That's what the general statute is. Lease. 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 That's a girl's um, name. One of the things that we came up with. Was Oh, yeah. that if yeah. we have something to show people, I think the reason that some of the, what the planning board did fail was people couldn't see anything.